identification of the salt involves identifying two components of the salt. Salts have a cation, every salt will have an anion. So if you can identify the cation, and if you can identify the anion, and then you fuse them together, you have identified that salt. So basically, that's how the concept works. The concept in identification of salt works by identifying the cation and identifying the anion. So identification of salt, uh, identification of salt requires identification of the cation and requires the identification of the anion. Now, even the cation, we can narrow down the list. The common cations that needs identification or that will be subjected to identification, the SPM will be Fe2+, Fe3+, Cu2+, okay? And then, now Fe2+, Fe3+, Cu2+, are very famous because they are colored. They have color, distinct color. That's a green color. That's brown. So this will form green colored compounds, brown colored compounds that will give you blue colored compounds. They're very distinct. Now, besides that, you need the ions that will be subjected to PB2 plus, Zn2 plus, Al3 plus. Okay. Then followed by Mg2 plus and Ca2 plus. Basically, these are the cat ions that you will be subjected to. All right. Now, the N ions, this is basically the narrow, I'm giving you a narrow list of cat ions that you need to know. And for N ions, basically it is SO4, two minus, it is uh, CL minus, which includes BR minus and I minus, this counts as one package like that. And then you have your CO3, two minus, then you will have your NO3 minus, that's all. Basically these are the N ions that comes under the list of identification. So if you have identified your N ion, let's say happens to be a nitrate, and if you have identified, let's say your cat ion happens to be copper two, therefore your salt will be copper two nitrate. You just fuse it together. All right, and that's the concept of identification of salt. So under the concept of identification of salt, for cat ion, we have its own set of reagents we use for identifying the salt. So basically the reagents that we use to identify the tank ions will be the sodium hydroxide and ammonia solution, not liquid. It's not ammonia liquid. Ammonia liquid is different. This is ammonia solution. Okay, and you will refer to as ammonia solution. Huh? All right, okay. So that is basically that. Okay, because ammonia is a weak base. It will not undergo complete ionization. So. Uh, in, the, in the solution form, most of its particles will be NH3 ammonia. That's why it's called ammonia solution and not ammonium hydroxide. That means this will be basically the form of ammonium hydroxide, ammonium ion and OH minus, plus many, many, many or abundantly ammonia molecules. So overall, it's called ammonia solution, but it's actually the ammonium ion that is going to react, which we will discuss later. So sorry, not the ammonium ion, it's the OH minus ions that's going to get. Okay. Now, for N ion, they have their own separate tests. Okay, so this has its own set of tests, which every student must recognize. That has its own set of tests. Okay, and we fuse it together the results and we get the salt. Now, when you're doing the test, another thing sometimes students confuse is that this is your test tube. Okay, this is your test tube. You put in the salt. When you put in the salt, you have your cat ion and you have your N ion both present at the same time. Okay? Both are present at the same time. The cat ion and the N ion both are present at the same time. So when you are carrying out cat ion tests, all right, when you are carrying out cat ion tests, you're not separating the cat ion from the N ion and doing the test, no. While you're doing the cat ion test, the N ion is still present, but the N ion will not participate, which means the N ion will act as a spectator ion while the cat ion is being tested, all right? Similarly, when you're doing tests on the N ion, when you're carrying this test, which is for the N ion intended, 
your cat ion is still present because we cannot separate them. But the cat ion will not respond to it and therefore it will act as a spectator ion. And that's how the concept works. So you collect the results and then you fuse together and you identify your salt. Okay, now that is the aspect of identification. But there are other, uh, what you call, uh, uh, what, uh, information that can be derived before we can do this identification. Okay, because salts have so many other properties and we can make use of that properties to identify the salt themselves besides this identification of salt. All right, so we go to that first. For example, all right, salts undergo what we call thermal decomposition. So thermal decomposition can give us a certain amount of information. All right, and from there, sometimes we can, we can predict the entire salt itself without even knowing what it's its anion and cation. That means without doing the identification of the cation, without doing the identification of the anion, by doing thermal decomposition, we sometimes can straight away tell you what the salt is. And therefore, thermal decomposition becomes important. All right, so now we are taking a look at thermal decomposition. Now, thermal decomposition is subjected to two types of salt which commonly undergoes thermal decomposition. The word thermal means heat, decomposition means breakdown of the salt. So the salt will break down upon heating to two or three components, and based on the products that is obtained, we can identify the salt. Okay, let's look at thermal decomposition. Thermal decomposition is subject to two types of salt. One, carbonate salts. The other one, nitrate salts. Okay, uh, two, only these two. That means thermal decomposition in your syllabus at SPM, you will not be learning about sulfate salts. You will not be learning about chloride, bromide, iodide salts, no. It will be only carbonate salts and nitrate salts. Okay, now carbonate salts or nitrate salts, whenever you learn, you have to divide them into two groups. One, uh, uh, group one, Carbonate salts, non group one carbonate salts, non group one, okay? Non group one carbonate salts. One is group one carbonate salts, the other one is non group one carbonate salts, always differentiate like that. And same thing here, group one nitrate salts and non group one nitrate salts, okay? So that's how you should approach your thermal decomposition. So, first, thermal decomposition involves carbonate salts, nitrate salts. Under the carbonate salts, I will further divide them into group one carbonate salts and non-group one carbonate salts. Nitrate salts also the same thing. Okay, let's take a look at group one carbonate salts. Okay, take a look at group one carbonate salts. Now, group one carbonate salts, group one carbonate salts are stable. are stable carbonate salts and will not undergo decomposition. Are stable carbonate salts and will not undergo decomposition. Okay, all right, that means sodium carbonate will not undergo decomposition. Potassium carbonate will not undergo decompo uh, decomposition. All right, whereas rest of the carbonates will undergo decomposition, including ammonium carbonate. Ammonium carbonate will undergo decomposition. Zinc carbonate will undergo decomposition. They fall under this. Only group one will not. So group one carbonates will not undergo decomposition. Will not undergo decomposition. So in other words, if I were to give you a carbonate salt, we heat it and we find that there's no decomposition, it's, it states that the salt is a stable salt. Uh, it means that it's a group one carbonate salt. So you can say it is either lithium carbonate, sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate. You can already identify. You no need to do the cation and ion. Of course, if you want to know exactly among the three which, then yes. Okay, but for group one, normally this is how we summarize. But for non-group one carbonate salts, they will undergo decomposition. Okay, so now we look at non-group one carbonate salts. We look at that. All right, so XCO3, all 
all right? This triangle is to indicate heating. So that means if it decomposes, it means thermal decomposition. This X will become an oxide and carbon dioxide will be released. So you will get a metal oxide as a product and of course carbon dioxide, and that's your metal covering. These are the products you get, all right? Now further to it, let's say you have zinc. Zinc carbonate, upon heating, you are expected to get zinc oxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, yeah, there's something unique. Now, what is something unique here? Zinc carbonate is a white solid. That is nothing about this carbonate, nothing to do with this carbonate, white solid. But zinc oxide appears in two colors. It has a transition color, so to speak. When it is hot, it is yellow in color. That means when it undergoes thermal decomposition, you will see a yellow solid. But as it cools down, it will become a white solid. So here, the appearance of yellow solid during decomposition followed by white solid, it already, we can already conclude that the salt has to be zinc carbonate without even doing a separate cation test or a separate anion test. That means I no need to do a cation test, an anion test through the thermal decomposition itself. I can say, oh, that is zinc carbonate salt. The salt that has been heated, it's a zinc carbonate salt. And this is the advantage of thermal decomposition. But this only involves certain salts only, not all salts. Okay? The next one will be your lead carbonate. So let's talk about lead carbonate. Your lead carbonate is another unique salt. When heated, it gives you lead oxide plus carbon dioxide. Remember, this happens to all non-group one company. Anything which is non-group one company under your SPM syllabus will have this property. They will decompose to give you a metal oxide and carbon oxide. Now, again, your lead oxide is unique. It, when it's hot, it is brown in color. But when it's cold, it becomes yellow in color. And this is unique only for lead to oxide. This is lead to oxide. So this is lead to carbonate, lead to oxide. You can say lead to carbonate eh? because this is a multiple oxidation state element. It has to be mentioned as lead to carbonate. You can't just say lead carbonate. Eh? Okay. So if you have, if you are given a salt, let's say X, and you heat it up, and you find that it does decompose. Okay. Of course, it does decompose, and you find the products are brown at first because it's hot, it's brown, and then when you when you leave it to room temperature, as it cools, it becomes yellow. You straight away can conclude that salt is lead to carbonate because this is a unique property of lead to carbonate. All right? So these are some of the advantages of, of thermal decomposition. That is why it's a, you have to make a point of knowing this thermal decomposition. Okay? All right? So I hope you understand what I've said so far.